Tonight, the details continue to develop around the school shooting in Uvalde. President Joe Biden and the First Lady are planning to visit Texas in the coming days, but an exact date hasn't yet been set. Meantime, we're hearing more from family members of the victims tonight and learning more things that happened right before the shooting. We're also learning more about the victims. 19 children, two teachers were killed in yesterday's shooting. And so far, families have released photos for most of the victims. Some victims between the ages of eight and 10 years old. One student had just attended an award ceremony. Eva Mireles is one of the teachers who was killed. Now, her daughter shared a statement calling her mom a hero. Adeline Ruiz posted the message on social media saying, quote, Mom, I have no words to describe how I feel right now, tomorrow, and for the rest of my life. She went on to say, quote, I want you to come back to me, Mom. I miss you more than words can explain. Now, our Steve Spreester is in downtown Uvalde tonight where our community is in mourning, and we're also hearing from the families of the victims tonight, Steve. You know, Stephanie, in many ways, this is a community that's dealing with things they have never had to deal with before. Of course, that mass horrific shooting inside a classroom at Robb Elementary, not far from where I'm standing in the heart of downtown Uvalde. They've had to deal with a crush of media and they are dealing with a lot of questions tonight about exactly what happened and about the confusion right after that mass shooting. And one of the people with a lot of questions tonight is a grandmother, Rosa Maria Ramirez. She heard about the shooting in Uvalde, but had no idea that her 10 year old granddaughter, Alethea, was one of the 19 people who were shot and killed. She talked to ABC News today about the confusion. She went to the Civic Center down the street from where I'm standing right now, looking desperately for her granddaughter, but she wasn't there. Listen. So if she's not there, where is she? They wouldn't, they wouldn't tell us that she was, all this time, she had, they had her little body right there, in there, all those little kids in there. They didn't let us know till midnight. Alethea Ramirez, just 10 years old. Her grandmother, very proud of her, says she was a very talented little girl who loved to draw. She says the last time she saw Alethea on Mother's Day, she was in a desperate search when she heard the worst possible news. Now, among her many questions have to do with the alleged shooter. How can they let an 18 year old buy guns, especially those guns that he had? Wouldn't they have any questions? Why would he buy them? Outside of Robb Elementary, as the day has gone by, more and more flowers have been dropped off. I talked to a couple of lifetime residents of Uvalde who were bringing flowers. They knew the grandmother of the alleged shooter who was shot. They also knew one of the girls who was the victim. And you find that story over and over again here in Uvalde, a very tight knit community. People know everyone that was involved in this accident, in, excuse me, involved in this incident, this horrific incident, and they are reaching out to each other to help. And these two lifelong residents, all they wanted to do was drop off flowers in remembrance of the 19 children and the two teachers that died. A lot of questions, as I said, around this shooter are John Paul Barajas following the investigation into this shooter. He joined us outside the store where investigators say that gunman purchased those weapons. John Paul. Steve, that's right. As time passes, we're learning more details about the days that led up to this mass shooting, as well as the moments during and after. According to DPS director Steve McCraw, the shooter illegally bought the semi-automatic rifle here on May 17th, just days after turning 18. The following day, he bought 375 rounds of ammunition. On the 20th, he came back to Oasis Outback and bought a second semi-automatic rifle. Then just four days later came the carnage. Across saying the shooter shot his grandmother in the face. We are hearing she is still alive. The shooter then drove away and crashed near Rob Elementary. Investigators say he was confronted by law enforcement but managed to get in through a back door. He opened fire, killing 19 kids and two adults.
in these horribly dark days, we see the best in humanity, the best in people, and that's certainly been the case here in Uvalde and across South Texas in the form of blood donations. All over South Texas and right here in the wake of devastation, people are coming together to help by donating blood. So much so that some had to be turned away. Try to donate blood. They're not accepted anymore. Overfilled. Super happy about it. Everywhere is full, which is amazing because um, they did have a blood shortage yesterday. These two women, a few of the many that weren't able to donate. Instead, they made signs. Uvalde strong and remember their names, their messages. This is our way of just making sure everyone knows that we're thinking about them. It's sad. No child, nobody, no matter what the age, should have to go through something like this. It's just evil. That's what it is. It's pure evil. According to Francine Pina with South Texas Blood and Tissue, they started seeing people for donations at 9 at the Herbie Ham Activity Center. By 9.30, they were at capacity for the two buses they brought down. The um, response was overwhelming. Um, we saw people coming in from Del Rio, Eagle Pass, um, of course here Uvalde, um, Sabinal, uh, surrounding communities. Uh, we saw over 125 donors here today. We she adds, in South Texas, they collected over a thousand units of blood today, and their appointments are also booked through next Wednesday. If you were turned away. She adds, no matter the outpouring of support that we're seeing right now, there will always be a need for blood donations. She said she recommends making an appointment, but if you would like to help out sooner, they are having another blood drive at the Hermingham Activity Center tomorrow at 9 a.m. If you decide to go to that, it is recommended to show up as soon as possible because they probably will have to cut people off at a certain point. In Uvalde, John Paul Barajas, KSAT, 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. And certainly there is an outpouring of support among the people in the line, like you said, people from San Antonio, Eagle Pass, people from, of course, Uvalde, wanting to donate blood, wanting to help in any way they can. Remember their names. Uvalde strong seems to be a lot of what we have seen in some of the signs around the city. We've also seen one word that has come up again and again. Pray. More than 2000 people actually took part in a prayer vigil that filled the Uvalde County Fairplex today for an interfaith vigil put on by the Baptist Temple Church in Uvalde. Texas Governor Greg Abbott was there. United States Senator Ted Cruz was there and Democratic candidate for governor Beto O'Rourke was also there. Our Patty Santos was also at the Fairplex tonight as people took part, came together to pray for healing. Patty. Yeah, Steve, this community is looking for the why. Why did this happen? What can they do for the families? Are there any words? And there aren't, but take a listen. This was inside the Fairplex. It was filled to the max. It was standing room only. People of all ages just really felt the need to come out and support the families and those that are hurting. They wanted to pray and just hold each other. Pastor Tony Gruber with Baptist Temple Church read Psalms 46, reminding this town that God is still with them. He says there's no answers. There's no words that can be said that are enough to stop the aching hearts tonight, but Uvalde is standing together. I pray that God will give them the strength to get through it, and it's difficult. I know, it's, it's hard. I can't imagine what they're feeling. We're here, and we're praying for them. That it's not, to me, it's like it's not enough. I just, that we're just here for them and that we're together. And you know, what was so heartbreaking about this vigil tonight is that there were so many children that were grieving the loss of their classmates, some of them holding signs with the names of the victims, other children so innocent and unaware of the tragedy that their community is enduring at this time. And I got to tell you something, this community has been so graceful. It's taken this pain with such a dignity. There are so many media from around the world uh, just surrounding this community. But this town, this community has shown nothing but kindness to all of these strangers. Steve. 
I can just echo that so well, Patty. As a matter of fact, when we were doing our five o'clock live shot, not far from where we're standing right now, a uh, local resident of Uvalde came out with cinnamon rolls that she baked and was offering them to people that were in the park, media, people that had the signs that said, remember their names. She just came out and thought people could use a cinnamon roll. That's among the spirit of Uvalde and the coming together of this community. There are also so many people in San Antonio that are trying to help out. We told you the police department had units here. The fire department still has personnel here. I actually saw a San Antonio fire department ambulance passed just before we took this live shot. But there are also people that are just dropping everything and coming here to help, including Josh Palacios. He owns the El Remedio taco trucks that you see throughout San Antonio, including downtown. He dropped everything, jumped in his truck, pulled down to the Civic Center and put up a sign that said free tacos. Here's why he said he came. We're here because, um, you know, it hits home. I have two daughters of my own, both middle schoolers, um, you know, and we're here to give back. You know, we're here to be with the people from Uvalde. Um, I feel like it's our priority to be here and support them during these difficult times. We also know that there was a nursing association that came that baked cookies and took them to Uvalde Memorial Hospital, where some of these little victims are still being treated after that shooting. We also know that Chris Madrid's food truck, the burger joint in San Antonio, I actually passed that food truck as I was coming into town. They were feeding first responders not far from the ditch where they pulled the gunman's truck out where he allegedly crashed got out and exchanged gunfire before he went to that elementary school. What is really apparent down here is that Uvalde is a strong, resilient community, but that they are also realizing very clearly tonight that they are not alone. Stephanie, back to you in San Antonio. All right, Steve, thank you for that. You know, in the wake of this horrific school shooting, you're probably wondering, how can I help? Well, in addition to giving blood, you can also donate to the official funds that were set up to help the families of the school shooting victims. And we have those official funds listed for you on KSAT.com. All you have to do is look for the article that we're showing you on this screen. Click on it. Our coverage of the Uvalde school shooting continues after the break. The investigation into the Uvalde school massacre continues. Governor Greg Abbott held a press conference saying that there was very little warning as to what was about to take place. He also said that investigators are still trying to figure out more information about the alleged shooter. Reportedly, there has been no criminal history identified yet. He may have had a juvenile record, but that is yet to be determined. There was no known mental health history of the gunman. The governor said that local officials told him that the community has a problem with mental health. As we've reported, the gunman in this case bought two assault rifles within days of each other before that shooting took place. The governor also spoke about legislation that he signed into law that puts more responsibility onto school districts to put active shooter protocols into place. And you know, the country continues to deal with mass shootings. Between 2009 and 2020, the five deadliest mass shootings involve the use of assault weapons and or high capacity magazines. And that's according to research from the Gun Violence Prevention Organization. Every town. Now, Governor Greg Abbott said that an AR-15 was used in this particular shooting. And through its research of mass shootings, every town, that organization I just told you about, says that six times as many people are shot when assault weapons are used in mass shootings. Every town says that semi-automatic firearms are designed to fire rounds at a greater velocity than most other firearms. So naturally, when something like this happens, what happens after that? Well, the debate over gun laws, right? That came back into focus after gubernatorial candidate Beto O'Rourke confronted Governor Greg Abbott today at his press conference. Listen. Totally predictable when you sir, you're out of line. Sir, sir, you're out of line. Please leave this auditorium. 
Now, Beto O'Rourke says that Abbott and other lawmakers need to take more action on gun control. He said that legislation that would require universal background checks or enact red flag laws, safe storage locks, or the banning of assault rifles have all been passed up. We recently saw mass shootings in El Paso, Santa Fe High School, and Sutherland Springs. Also new tonight, the NAACP sent a letter to Governor Greg Abbott, and it's calling on the governor not to attend this week's National Rifle Association Conference. The group is urging the governor to enact, quote, gun control measures in your state that will save countless innocent lives, including those of children, end quote. Everywhere you went tonight, you could feel a lot of emotion, especially at a vigil for the shooting victims at Main Plaza. People there were hugging each other, they were praying, and they stood in silence as the bell rang in honor of those shooting victims. Oh, that bell rang once every minute for the 21 victims killed. Some people took the opportunity to protest gun policy. Others said that more should be done about mental health, but others took the time to mourn together. It's all of us in it together, and that is uh, it just lifts my spirits a little bit. And, you know, it doesn't fix the problem, but it does make it feel, you know, a lot easier to tackle when there's more people to help. And you saw that many people were leaning on each other for support during this very difficult time. We continue to remember the victims in the shooting online, ksat.com. We're releasing pictures and stories about those victims as the information continues to come into our newsroom. Our team is updating articles, especially that one that you see on your screen as we get new information. You can follow this coverage online at ksat.com. Now switching gears, we're taking a live look outside. This is Sky 12 over our city and everything looks nice and clear. 73 degrees, not really much to complain about outside when, you know, this is what it looks and feels like, Adam. Yeah, weather-wise, we uh, had a good day today, especially after some decent rainfall last night and the aquifer got a good drink of water. It's up nearly a foot today and likely still responding to the recent rainfall. Usually it takes a few days for rain falls like that to really settle in and give us our official final aquifer boost. Unseasonably cool tonight, running below average, a quick temperature rebound, however, and Noah's hurricane forecast is in for the 2022 Atlantic Basin. Let's take a look at it and no surprise here. Well, they're forecasting an above average hurricane season, a 65% chance of an above average season. One of the primary ingredients is above average sea surface temperatures again, and the presence of La Nina, which typically diminishes wind shear over the Atlantic Ocean and even weakens the trade winds a little bit. 87, that was our high today, a few degrees below average, even 63 this morning, a little below average. We picked up just under half an inch of rain from the rainfall last night. And behind it with the cold front, dew point of 50 degrees. Lack of mugginess in the air today. It felt good. It still feels good. That's going to allow our temperature to fall off pretty efficiently tonight. Right now in the 70s, some 60s in the hill country. Bandera 69, Comfort now 64, 70 even in Seguin, and we're 69 in Holotus. But check this out. Tomorrow morning, some upper 50s. We're talking nearly 10 degrees below average. Holotus, Rio Medina 59, Floresville about 60, Converse 60, south side of San Antonio about 62. By the afternoon, Nothing but sunshine and 92 degrees. So we go from below average in the morning to a little above average in the afternoon. A big temperature spread with this drier air and lack of humidity. And no triple digits on the map. Looks like most of us in the lower 90s, even some upper 80s in the hill country. Bernie 87, even Leon Springs and Timberwood Park about 89 for the high temperature. Meanwhile, Elmendorf 92. Most noticeable change. The next seven days will be in those morning temperatures on their way back up into the low 70s with higher humidity this weekend. Highs in the mid 90s. Unfortunately, no chance of rain, just sunshine. All right, Adam, thank you. So, you know, over, since this happened yesterday in Uvalde, we've been hearing athletes, different uh, sports teams talk about this. Everything kind of is intersecting, even in the world of sports, right? Yeah, it started Cowboys. with Steve Kerr, as yes. we talked about yesterday. Now it's transferred over to the Dallas Cowboys, our first chance to talk to them about that tragedy that happened in Uvalde. When we come back, you'll hear what they had to say about that. And Colin Kaepernick works out for the first time with an NFL team. Coming up.
football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. The first time since organized team activities opened this week, the Dallas Cowboys allowed the media into their workouts today. It has been our first chance for the rookies to meet the veterans to begin this voluntary mini camp being held at the star. But their minds were on the 19 children who lost their lives in the elementary school children in Uvalde. And they were their hearts after practice today. I have kids that go to school too, you know, and uh, you know, their safety is all I care about. And you know, if if I don't feel safe, uh, you know, sending my kids to school, I know other parents will feel the same way. We're talking about children. We're talking about the future. Um, I mean, I don't have kids and can't imagine having to send my kid to school with that anxiety. Um, with that, honestly, it, it makes me fearful to have children, and that's not right. That's sad. It's a lot that needs to be done. But we're not doing anything. Our, our leaders are just sitting back, uh, collecting checks, and just watching things happen. You know, so uh, I think I think we can get it done. But it's all going to take a collective effort. Colin Kaepernick, who hasn't played in the NFL since 2016, worked out in Las Vegas Raiders today. That's according to ESPN. And for Kaepernick, this is his first workout since he has run out of the league for kneeling during the national anthem to protest racial injustice. He did meet with the Seahawks in Seattle in 2017, but nothing ever came of that, and his career in the NFL appeared to be over. Over. Kaepernick is now 34 years old. A Nevada judge today ruled in favor of former Las Vegas Raiders head coach John Gruden, denying the NFL's motion to compel arbitration and the league's motion to dismiss the case outright. But now this could lead to a possible jury trial after Gruden claimed in his lawsuit that the league and his commissioner, Roger Goodell, leaked Gruden's emails to force his removal on October the 11th. Those emails included racist, anti-gay, misogynistic language that the league had in their possession since 2021. But in Gruden's lawsuit, he claims he leaked that information to the Wall Street Street Journal and New York Times to quote harm Gruden's reputation and force him out of his job. Game five of the Eastern Conference Finals next. Before game five of the Eastern Conference Finals tonight in Miami, there is a moment of silence for the 21 lives loss at the Robb Elementary School in Uvalde. Former Spur Derek White does get into the lane here, finishes with a floater to put Miami up by five. White again going to the rim, puts it up and in, but Miami's Gabe Vincent nails a jumper from the top of the key and it's a two point heat lead after one. Duncan Robinson helps give Miami a seven-point lead after he drains his three. But just before the half, White with a bounce pass to Al Horford, who knocks down the short jumper to cut Miami's lead down to five at halftime. Boston opens up the third on an 8-0 run to take the lead by as many as three. Grant Williams gets the 14-footer to drop. Boston starts to pull away. At the end of the third, Jason Tatum dry spins and finishes with a the layup. Then Jalen Brown gets the jumper to fall from the free throw line, and it's 11-point Boston lead going to the fourth. Brown's hot shooting continues as he knocks down back-to-back three-pointers. Boston on a 24 to 2 run to push their lead out to 23. Brown led Boston with 25. Derek White 14. Boston takes game 5, 93 to 80, and a 3 2 lead in this series. Now we'll see if the Mavs can hang on for another elimination game tomorrow night. We'll see. We'll mm -hmm. be right back after this. We continue to remember the victims online at ksat.com. Pictures are being released and stories about those victims continue to come into our newsroom. Our team is updating the article that you see on your screen as families continue to share information with us. You can follow this information, this coverage online at ksat.com. It's a story, of course, that will continue developing and it's our mission here at KSAT to bring you the very latest. For all the up-to-date information, just scan this QR code. It's gonna take you right to everything that we know so far. The article is updated with information that we've developed throughout the day yesterday and today, and of course, we'll continue to update it as new information comes in. Most noticeable changes in the days ahead will be the morning temperatures. Unseasonably cool tomorrow morning at 60 degrees, and then by the weekend, our low temperatures are back into the lower 70s. As for afternoons, we're largely look, just looking at sunshine and low to mid 90s all the way through this upcoming Memorial Day weekend. Adam, thank you. Well, that does it for the night beat. Don't forget that Good Morning San Antonio starts at 430. Have a wonderful night. We hope that you sleep peacefully, and we'll see you tomorrow.